Welcome to Branched's webinar. We're going to start in just a moment as our LinkedIn live stream starts. We are thrilled to have you here. Welcome to the Empowered by Data, Fostering a Culture of Inquiry, hosted by Branchette, Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branchette. My name is Kim Igwe, and I am the Professional Development Associate here at Branchette. Thank you for joining us. We are honored to have each of you here today. I know you're eager to hear from our panelists, so we're gonna get started quickly after my three minute intro. I briefly wanna share the mission of Branch Ed. It's our vision to strengthen, grow and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the third webinar in our 2022-2023 webinar series. The purpose of the 2022-2023 Nuts and Bolts series is to highlight the application of Branch, Branch Ed's signature framework for the quality preparation of educa educators, which outlines a roadmap to create teacher preparation programs that meet the needs of our increasingly diverse student body. It seeks to build equity-oriented educator preparation programs that prepare educators to reflect, respect, and value the diversity of America's PK through 12 school children. The framework identifies six critical principles that teacher ed preparation providers can leverage to redesign their programs. Two of these principles, community of learners and data empowerment provide the foundation for the remaining principles. Today's webinar is focused on the data empowerment principle which empowers individual and the collective to assess and engage with their own data to improve their community. We're thrilled to hear from Dr. Amy Clifton and Dr. Beth Garcia today from West Texas A&M University to learn how they have transitioned from a culture of compliance to an active culture of inquiry, utilizing an authentic and ongoing cycle of evidence-based improvement that begins with asking thoughts questions and moves through organizational learning and action and ends with an evaluation of the effectiveness, effectiveness of actions taken. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to share a couple of housekeeping reminders. One, we're recording this webinar and it will be available on our Branch Ed resource portal, portal along with many other resources. Um, we are live streaming, live streaming on LinkedIn. And you can use the chat for resources or links or any tech issues. Thank you to our Branch Ed team for your support. Um, and use the Q&A feature to ask any questions of the panelists. We'll have time at the end for a Q&A. Before handing it over to the panelists, let me briefly introduce them. Joining us from West Texas A&M University, we have Dr. Amy Clifton, who has over two decades of experience in education. She has served as a teacher, coach, assistant principal, and principal. Currently, Dr. Clifton is a data specialist and instructor at West Texas A&M. Before joining faculty, she was a student um, there where she earned her bachelor's, master's, and doctorate. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Clifton. Dr. Beth Garcia um, joined the College of Education and Social Sciences at West Texas A&M University in 2012. She received her bachelor's, master's, and doctorate there as well. Her research interests include adolescent literacy, the use of series books as a teaching medium, and effective practices in teaching English as a second language. We are so excited to have both of you here today. Thank you so much for that warm and wonderful welcome. We are so excited to be here today and sharing with you our journey on data. And it was has been quite a journey and we are there's no end in sight. It just continues. 
So this is the Nuts and Bolts webinar, Empowered by Data, Fostering a Culture of Inquiry. And again, I'm Dr. Beth Garcia from West Texas A&M University. And my colleague, Dr. Amy Clifton is here as well as we are getting the PowerPoint up to share with you. We'll go ahead and advance on and start discussing with you a little bit about our story and where we began with data. It's not advancing. <laughs> There we go. And so in the beginning of our story, we like to say that we were very information rich, but data poor. We had large amounts of information and data coming through our Office of Teacher Preparation, but we really didn't have a system in place to organize, analyze, or share this data with internal or external stakeholders. So that's why we say that we were really information rich, but data poor, because if you have lots of information, but you're not able to use it, to analyze it, to drive instruction or make data informed decisions, then you really don't have data. You have a lot of information. Maybe you can relate to our story. We were collecting raw data, but without that proper organization and analysis, it really wasn't useful to our stakeholders and we weren't making data informed decisions. We were making decisions based on, I feel, I think, and things like that, instead of what data was actually telling us. And so where we were, <laughs> spreadsheets upon multiple spreadsheets. We had spreadsheets to keep up with the spreadsheets we had, we had so many. So we had also multiple, da multiple data and learning management systems. In-house, we, we created a management system called CRAFT, and it was built by our IT team to keep up with candidate records. We will state that it was very limited in the beginning and it's still limited. It's basically a management system that can keep up with what candidates are in our program, what exams they've taken and on what dates and where their placements are in the field. So again, it's limited, but at least it keeps a candidate record for us. We also have our learning management system, Blackboard, where our students engage in their coursework. We have student files, both hard copy and electronic versions, and we have our university information systems. And so where we began was, if we wanted to paint, paint a complete data picture on a candidate, we were having to pull from multiple sources and data management systems to find different information in multiple and various places. So what we did, we had this aha moment. We had this realization that housing data and presenting large quantities of this data to faculty really weren't yielding the results that we desired. We gave our faculty the data. We put it in a OneDrive system. We shared documents. We shared the data with them. We gave them the links to this, but it was raw data. It was unorganized and it wasn't really usable to our faculty members. So we began very small. We began to organize our data and present to our stakeholders in a comprehensible manner. We guided faculty and stakeholders in an analysis process and we started off very simply by chunking our data. And so we're gonna go ahead and move forward into the very first thing that we did. And we call it our WTAMU report card. And so as we advance to that, we have a picture of our report card and we started off with a simple brochure. We began with our contact information, a little bit about why we were doing this report card. And we had a three year window or snapshot of every certification area that we certify in and our percentage of pass rates by those certification areas. And we update this each year. We provide it to our accrediting body, which is the Te Texas Education Agency, but it's also on our website for both internal and state, uh, external stakeholders as well. And on the second page of this, we have additional information. We have our accountability system for educator preparation reporting that we submit every year for our accreditation. 
We have Title II information and we have our legislative board budget information as well. So you can see that this is a very simple document. It's nothing, it's not rocket science, it's nothing grand, but it's some, where we started, just chunking our data and starting to organize it in a comprehensible manner. So where we're going now, we've identified the need for a data management system that will do more than what our limited systems, having multiple and various systems will do, especially beyond spreadsheets. We've identified simplicity as the data management system that we would like to obtain, but we couldn't sit back on our laurels and just say, oh, we'll wait until this data management system comes to us. We knew that we had to start with where we were, and we found very quickly that getting a data management system in a university is a complicated, long, and difficult process. And so we didn't want to sit and just wait for this data system to come to us. We began with what we had, and we began to build our own data management systems in place so that we could organize data, engage in a process of analysis, and then share this data with internal and external stakeholders so that we can begin making data-informed decisions. We also have collaborative data analysis that are driving those improvements within our program. So this brings us to an innovative and strategic way to make change, to have change take place. And so we really started with our problem of practice. We wanted to ensure that our candidates were day one ready whenever they entered the classroom, wherever they were going to teach. And so through that, we looked at our coursework, we looked at our testing policies, and we landed on some things that we wanted to change and adjust. Um, we wanted to ensure that we had systematic analysis for our PPR, which is our pedagogy and professional responsibilities certification exam areas. We also wanted to look at our content certification areas. We certify over 25 different content areas, and we really wanted to take an in-depth look at those things. Um, we started by embedding some of those practice exams into specific courses in their coursework. We wanted to um, embed the content exams in one place and maybe the PPR in another place. We also worked very, very closely. And when I say we, I'm the data specialist, and I worked very, very closely with the testing coordinator to ensure that we were gathering quality data. Um, and of course, with that data, we wanted to be good stewards. We wanted to ensure that privacy of our candidates was being maintained and that we were also looking at those areas that in education can sometimes be um, not as a bright spot, but can sometimes be missed. We wanted to ensure that all of our candidates, no matter their economic status or race, are getting the best education and preparedness for the classroom. So quality data. We wanted to make sure that we were gathering and looking at the right types of data. So this could be attitudinal measures. It could be observational measures. It could actually be outcomes. And today we're really talking about our journey and how we looked at some of our quantitative outcomes that our candidates were, um, were giving. We really had four questions because this truly is um, using the data to empower a culture of inquiry. So those guiding questions, as you can see on your screen are, what data, what data should we include? The second one is where's is the data needed to accomplish the to accomplish the goal of increasing our clinical teachers each semester. Um, what can, or how, excuse me, how can this data be used to support faculty in planning instruction? And then finally, when and how should we share this data? So we started with a new data collection process. It used to be just the, the testing coordinator and I sitting and collaborating and looking at spreadsheets. As Dr. Garcia said, we had a lot of spreadsheets. Um, looking to see how our candidates were performing in those practice 
certification exams that were embedded in coursework. And we would just look and see, oh, wow, look how much better they did this semester than last semester. That's basically where we started. So we wanted to ensure that in this process, we were going back to those guiding questions. What is the data we want to look at? And what's going to increase those clinical teaching numbers? We also needed to memorialize these processes because we were starting from scratch, a bunch of spreadsheets. And so we had data collection procedures, as you can see, that we simply just typed up step by step. I even highlighted a few places, you know, warning, make sure you do this because you're going to need it in the future. So the next thing that we wanted to ensure is that we were really looking at data analysis and the interpretation of the data. Now, it took a little bit to get to this point because we had big dreams and we wanted to make sure that we were creating a culture of data collaboration. And so we wanted to create a space where we could have those open and honest conversations. Hence, the data bootcamp was born. And using our guiding questions again, how can the data be used to support faculty in planning instruction? And then when and how are we going to use this data? And we had a lot of it. Honestly, we really just wanted to create a PLC, if you will, a professional learning com community with our academic colleagues. We wanted to have a meeting, a safe place where we could come look at numbers, look at our coursework and see if we can improve the experience and the preparation of our candidates. So we did, we had really big dreams, but we had to start small. You can only bite that element, elephant if you eat it one bite at a time, okay? So we looked at the data collection processes. We looked at our candidate success. Where are they being successful? What areas do they need support in? We wanted to know why are we looking at our practice exam data versus our official exam data? Now here at WT, we have specific policies for our candidates to be successful. We have them take practice certification exams and they need to have an 80% pass rate before they're given that official pass rate. Now, they can take as many practice exams as they choose, but when they get to that official, it's really our, our, our mission is that they pass it the first time. Because in Texas, it costs every time that they take an official exam. And we wanted to save our candidates as much as we could so that they only had to pay for that official certification exam one time hence the 80% rule. We also wanted to make sure that we were improving instruction, but how do we prove instruction if we don't even know where our candidates are on the practice exam? So those were just some of the guiding inquiries that helped us start our data boot camps. We invited our educational departmental faculty first, but we had big dreams, like I said, we wanted to include the entire college. We wanted to talk to our colleges at our university that supported our secondary uh, certification candidates, maybe those who were going into ag or going into secondary high school teaching English or math or science. So that's where we're going. And the way we're going to accomplish that is through organization of sign-up geniuses. We um, offered Zoom meetings, we offered in-person meetings, just a way to build that collaboration and break down those silos that are so common at higher ed. We also wanted to include our external stakeholders. So much of our data was housed within the Office of Teacher Preparation, and we wanted to ensure that we were including our outside stakeholders, our public education stakeholders, to help guide this process. So as you see on your screen, this is actually an example of a shared data file. We gave access to faculty so that they could see that we were broke, we broke down our certification areas essentially into two different, two different, I guess, folders, if you will. We had our primary, which was our EC all the way through eighth grade, and then our secondary, which was grades seven through 12. 
we, we decided to put our PPR in its own folder because all candidates have to take that as certification. Now from this, I've broken down the primary folder. Um, that's that first little screenshot. The screenshot that's even bigger is what's in that primary folder. As you can see, these are just PDFs. Each one of those PDFs represents a data report. We'll get into that a little bit later. But for this specific folder, we've got our core four eight. So for a core subject areas, you've got four different ones. So there were four different reports that had to be created to represent that data, as well as a preparation manual. Here in Texas, we have um, Pearson is our testing facilitators, and they actually supply preparation manuals that anyone has access to. This was pulled in as a resource for faculty to use whenever they're planning so that they would just they would know specifically what type of questions that a candidate might be asked when it came to a certain content area. And also science of teaching reading was an additional content area that our state added that preparation manual is included as well. So our very first data boot camp was on was in February of 2022. It was a great turnout. Faculty came. We had undergraduate faculty, we had graduate faculty. It was based on historical data. So we spent some time going over the processes and the gather and how we decided to present this one page report. As you can see on this one page report on the right side of your screen, we have several different studies here. The first study is a competency study. These are the domains and competencies that our teacher candidates are asked to be proficient on in order to go into the, to the, the area of being a teacher. And so we, we gathered thousands and thousands of, of Scantrons in that spreadsheet in order to create an average for that report. The next one that you will see is basically just a resource. It's a it's almost a guide a guide to see where we're going. This is a screenshot of the preparation manual and the breakdown of the official exam. Now the official exam is um, mirrored in the practice exam almost identically, but we have to make sure that we're maintaining confidentiality because this is from the state of Texas. And so we wanted to let our faculty know where are the areas and where are the domains that these questions that are that basically determine whether a candidate can go into that classroom are housed. The next piece. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And Dr. Dr. Clinton, yeah. I would just like to add here that, yes, our initial data focus has been greatly on testing. But the reason for that is our curriculum is focused around the domains and competencies and standards of teaching and education. And so you can see the domains and competencies there. And so we are using this testing data, looking at how our candidates are scoring on these competencies to then go back and look at our curriculum and start doing curriculum analysis and alignment, both vertically and horizontally with our faculty. And I will tell you that initially, and Dr. Clifton will talk about in just a moment, how we walk them through the analysis at first, but initially our, our faculty really focus on those competencies that had lowest scores and highest scores. And absolutely, those are things to consider when beginning that data analysis. But the analysis process also assisted them in looking beyond just high and low scores. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Moving down in this, in this one page report, we have our testing policy, and we just wanna ensure that we are doing what's best for our candidates. Our goal is 85% validity. So we actually took a wealth of um, a magnitude of numbers to determine how many times candidates are taking a practice exam, what their scores were, and then how they did perform on the official test once they took it. So that gives that information. 
And then finally, we wanted to know how are our candidates performing whenever they do get to that official exam. And this is a four year study of just pulling their um, hour at WT, our official exam pass rates. So this is all the information that was presented to faculty for that data boot camp, but we weren't done. So if we learned anything from our journey is that we need to ensure that our steps are collected. So for this first group, um, we have this competency study. We had the percentages, just like Dr. Garcia had talked about. We pulled the, um, the resource from the preparation manual. That was all included on the report with faculty. It was over a, a four-year span of information, and we wanted to ensure that they also had access to it electronically so that they could, they could reach out and see any information when they had time. So memorializing the report. So again, we had step-by-step -step procedures of how to produce the, the results you just saw, those, those graphs you just saw, so that no matter who is in the data specialist position, they can continue to create these resources for faculty to help improve and to help continually drive that cycle of improvement. As you can see, there were hot, there were links in the memorialization, so it's a very quick reference. Um, we really tried to make it as simple as possible, as easy to read as possible, in order to conquer such a magnitude of data for this first push. So as you can see, this is a little bit of our testing policy. And depending on the, the certification exam area, the report got longer or smaller. For our PPR certification area, it was longer because every single candidate through our program had to take that test. And so to give our validity, we wanted to ensure who was below that 80% and who may have been above that 80% and didn't meet the right or the certain criteria that we felt. If anyone has been in education for too long, you understand that we sometimes we have to go on a case by case scenario. We had some students that were possibly feeling a little frustrated because they had taken their practice exam three and four times and they couldn't get to that 80% threshold needed to get an official approval. As you can see on these different areas, we had some that hit and passed. And when they didn't meet that 80%, we had several. We gave them a first chance. Um, and then we had some that did very well and didn't pass. I mean, we, I mean, as you can see, there was one spotted right there. It made a 98 on a practice exam. But for some reason, they didn't pass that official. So we really wanted to ensure that we were looking at the whole picture of data to help guide our policies and help support our candidates through their journey to be a day one ready teacher. On the right side, this is the memorialization, memorialization of the actual re report. Lots of screenshots, lots of step-by-step, step-by-step -step, um, step -step examples of just how to create this report. Again, this is another piece of the report. This is the study, the four-year study. The report is at the top, the memorialization, memorializing it on the bottom. So formative assessment, we actually chose our practice exams as our formative assessment to see where we can guide instruction or where we can make improvements to our program or is our pathway the best pathway for each and every candidate. So we wanted to ensure that we were being culturally responsive to all of our data and ensuring that those practices that we were creating are going to give our candidates the best and the, the most compatible way to, to go through our program. So this was a boot camp. 
And you might think we might be doing some, I don't know, bell curve bench presses or something, but we really wanted our faculty to do all the heavy lifting. So we act, we designed some guided questions from our partners at Branch Ed and with Raise Your Hand Texas. We went through some some meetings and we've gone through conferences and we've gone through workshops to help improve our practices. And so we wanted to, to extend those strategies to our faculty. So during our data boot camp, we really wanted those discussions to take hold. We wanted to create an open and honest environment to help build on that culture of inquiry. So the data discussions, we had really quick uh, QR codes so that our faculty would have a quick access to um, the shared folder. We had a jam board so that if faculty wanted to just jot down on a little electronic sticky note, what they're seeing in the data to help guide instruction, that was an opportunity for them. And again, we wanted our faculty to do the heavy lifting of digging into the data. We created these reports. We wanted them to be very sim simple, but we wanted them to look and see the changes that maybe needed to be made instead of focusing in on what would have been a weakness, if you will. And I would just add here that our faculty know how to do research. They know how to look at data. But really going through this process and helping them analyze it using these guiding questions was very beneficial for us. Because had we gone in with analyzed data and said, look, these are our low competencies, curriculum needs to change, that culture of collaboration and actual change based on data informed practices would not have been as collegial or as welcomed. This is our faculty, our stakeholders, both internal and external, going through the process of looking at organized data and doing an analysis using guiding questions. They are coming to the results. They are the ones coming to those, making those informed decisions based upon the data. And then there is much more buy-in to making changes and revising curriculum because they are the ones who suggested it. So that's something we found really important when we were having these data discussions is that we don't need to come with the answers. We needed to come with organized, comprehensible data in a format that could be used. We tried it by giving them all the data in a raw format, all the information that didn't work. It was too much, it was too overwhelming. We've also tried it where we came in with everything analyzed in a nice report, which Dr. Clifton showed some very beautiful reports but that was just the organized data. It was really this process of going through and guiding questions and analysis that helped lead to systemic change. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. And of course, that is our goal. We wanted to make sure that that cycle of continual growth was always occurring. A growth mindset, a culture of data empowerment. And so we wanted to know what did our faculty think about our data boot camp, how it was presented, how um, the data was reported to, to them, the exercises that we had planned. And so we really felt that it was very crucial that we gain feedback from our faculty to ensure that if this is a good process, we can continue it. If it's not a good process, then we might need to go back to the drawing board. So this is what faculty said. It was about 73% that strongly agreed that they, they would see this boot camp activity relevant and applicable to their role here at WT. Some of our big takeaways is they really liked that big picture of data. Sometimes whenever you have all these spreadsheets and you have all these scantrons and you have all these numbers, you get lost. You cannot see the forest for the trees, if you will. And we tried and worked very hard over the course of several months to ensure that we created an environment to help those important data conversations occur. One of the, a couple of the, the highlights of these uh, feedback responses were it indicated the delivery and assessment of the content 
in my courses needs adjustment. Uh, one of the other faculty members says they were making connections. They loved that they could make connections to their to their courses through this data and how our candidates were performing. And also, they were willing to tell the story of the data, and they wanted to ensure that it was authentic and accurate. This is what's going to be specifically important whenever it comes to equity implications. We wanted to ensure change not focus on a weakness. We wanted to have a growth mindset in these, in these conversations, and we definitely wanted to build that culture of inquiry. They started asking the questions, and it was so awesome to just sit back and watch. But we wanted to make sure that this process was effective. And boy, did they tell us yes or no. I think overwhelmingly probably a yes, they really liked it. Um, they appreciated it. They could see just how many hours went into cre the creation, not only of the report itself, but also building in the time to facilitate a safe environment to have those sometimes difficult questions. Um, it was very effective were some of the responses, they, but they wanted more. They wanted more time to dig into the data. They start when they first started, they saw the long bar and then they saw the short bar. But as they started going through it and talking within their group, they're like, oh, but what if? And they started having those conversations. Um, they they again, they wanted more time to dig with their to dig in and to come up with possibly some action steps. It's the what next. OK, we have this data. We've, we've identified some areas that we might need to look at or we might need to change that we want to change. Now, what can I do? So quality assurance. We want to ensure that we are, we are maintaining the quality of our data and of our program. And so we wanted to ensure what are our next steps? How can we, in, how can we make sure that our EPP is achieving the outcomes that we want and believe it should achieve. We want to ensure that not only are we are we doing what's best for our students here in our area, but what are other other areas, other EPPs, other universities? How are they preparing teachers? Are we in line with that? I don't know if if any of you are competitive, but here at West Texas, we are very competitive and we want to be number one. And how how better to be number one is then to collaborate with other universities. Memorializing these processes was probably one of the big aha moments that we had. We had all this data. We were having these very informal conversations but there weren't any systems that were set up in order to continue to essentially see where we are and then to make a plan to get better, to go further. Um, make sure if, you, if you're thinking about going into one of these um, journeys, on one of these journeys, you need to write it down. Even when you don't think you need to write it down, write it down. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we wanted to make sure that we were sharing with our external stakeholders. Those would be our uh, public our public schools. We wanted to get their feedback. We're, we wanted to maintain that culture of continual improvement. So results. We did our initial boot camp back in February, and this is just a snippet of a change that we, we have seen when it comes to our PPR scores. That first, um, the, one of the columns on the 2018 to 21 shows that historical data that again was 823 um, total scan ran, ran versus just the spring semester. So we chunked that part to include only those candidates that took the PPR practice exam, which was up 110 students. We saw some movement, but why? We're forever going to be asking why. Was it a change in resources? Was it a change in instructors? Was the delivery of the instruction different? The questions 
continue to come. I think once you start asking questions, you just never stop. So we're starting to see some changes, but we still want to go deeper. So with the cycle of continuous improvement, we want to make sure that we're number one, getting feedback from our faculty. These are the people who work hard day in and day out, making those connections with our students and candidates and preparing them to be successful, putting that theory into practice. We want to ensure that what we're doing to help support them is good, but not just because we think it's good, the data is telling us it's good. The next thing that we want to do is we want to share. We want to continue and model that, that, that culture of collaborative. We want to be uh, presenters. We presented this information at um, one of our state conferences, gaining feedback from them. And so we are always welcome in order to improve the feedback. Quality checks. We've got to ensure that we have internal quality checks little systems here and there. For example, maybe when we create this data, we share this, the, the competency study every semester, but the policy study, maybe that only needs to be an annual study or maybe even every few years. So those are just some things that we're always wanting to ensure that we are double checking. And if you've been in education for long, they will change something. So make sure that we are monitoring and adjusting. Here in Texas, they may change our PPR to EdTPA. We don't know. So we're just going to keep following the data, what we have, and preparing our candidates for the next big thing. Now, with any new system, there's going to be some challenges. I guess you could just call it growing pains. These are just a few of the challenges that we encountered as we were going through this process. Logistical challenges of trying to purchase a data management system is something we kind of thought there might be, but didn't realize that it would be as monumental as it was. We're still in the process of trying to get that data management system of simplicity on the books but it's part of our journey. And then logistical, if we get this new data management system, who's going to implement it? So those logistics are some challenges that have to be identified and pre-planned for as well. And then time, we never seem to have enough time in the day to get everything done. The time to collect, the time to organize, the time to analyze, and then of course, the time to present to stakeholders, both internal and external. And so while we've had these challenges, as I stated earlier within our webinar, we didn't just sit back and wait for a data management system to come to us because as Dr. Clifton just said, we are still waiting on that. But we were able to start chunking it. And remember, we started very simply. So if some of those processes or some of those reports look very complicated and in-depth, it's where we grew to, not where we started from. Remember the very first thing we did was that very simple report card. And then we took that and were able to grow and expand and add because it does take a great deal of time to get there. But as you can see, once you memorialize that and you put those processes down in writing, it makes it that much easier to do it the next time. You have the template, you have the process. And so those are some uh, different things to think about as you're making the best use of your time. Exactly. And we are not going to not going to end on a on a challenging note. We're going to look at our bright spots because we truly enjoyed this journey. Faculty participation was high. We had undergrad and graduate faculty uh, participating in this this data meeting and um, we really appreciated them coming in support of what's best for our candidates and the appreciation across other colleges. We've had meetings with, uh, for example, our history department, and they are so grateful to see exactly how our candidates are performing in certain competency areas to see if their instruction may need to be altered or adjusted. Also, usable data 
to enable change and improvement. We always want to grow. And so we want to make sure that we're using our data and we're using good data to ensure that improvements can continue. And then just the establishment of all the memorialized processes, the collection, how are we going to house it? How are we going to present it? How are we going to analyze it? Those things were exciting to see it all come together when those faculty put their heads together and looked to see those changes that could be made. And we've also had positive, um, positive feedback from our stakeholders, our external stakeholders. We actually had one of our stakeholders ask, could you adjust your policy a little bit for, an, let's say, an STR exam so that that 80% isn't met? But since it's a new exam, maybe drop it down to 65. And we welcome this feedback. And actually, we are. We want to get as many um, certified candidates out there as possible. It was a great idea. And it was just an amazing collaboration between external stakeholders and our EPP for the, what's best for our candidates. So that's us. Dr. Amy Clifton and Dr. Beth Garcia. Um, we have um, time for questions and answers. Should I turn it back over to you, Kim? Yes, thank you so much uh, for the rich conversation and all of the tangibles that everyone can take away. I know I was jotting down my notes and looking closely at, at all of um, the resources y'all created. Thank you for sharing those with us. We already have one question in the Q&A box, which I will share in a moment. Um, if our participants, our viewers, if you have questions, please use that Q&A function in the webinar to ask any questions. And we'll start um, with one from, um, great, we're getting some in here. Uh, our first one is, which data systems are you are you thinking of using? Are you wanting to purchase um, to further your, your data inquiry? So we want to purchase Simplicity. It is one that we've done a great deal of research into. We've looked at TK20. We've looked at QuickBooks and some others. Some of our sister universities are using those, and they are very good systems. But for us and what we're wanting to do, simplicity really just seemed to fit, and it can do quite a bit of things. You can create workflows within it to assign um, to another professor, to a candidate. It also tracks their field placements, so you can assign field placements within simplicity. It does all those things that we've had multiple systems trying to do in one place. Dr. Garcia, we have two questions around that system, Simplicity. Um, can you say anything else about your process in identifying Simplicity as the system? I know you just said all the bells and whistles it offers. What is the process you went through to, um, in order to identify that system? I'm going to let Dr. Clifton take that one, and I will add to it as well. Awesome. Yes, we we started with a magnitude, just like Dr. Garcia said. We we had a few that we researched on. We reached out to those different companies and we held um, basically a presentation. We wanted a presentation where Dr. Garcia and myself first looked at it. We invited our um, department heads and deans to see just the demo, a data demo, if you will, where we could ask questions, can you do this? Can you do this? To make sure that we're meeting all of our needs. Once we had narrowed it down, then we, we proceeded in doing a faculty data, data demo where we invited our faculty, then we gathered information and we gathered um, survey results to see if faculty felt that this would be a good data management system because we wanted to include our faculty on this. We wanted them to have access. That was um, a concern or a strength that we really wanted from our faculty. We wanted them to be able to, um, to be involved. And we didn't want to we didn't want the data to be hidden. We didn't want them to think that we were holding it back. We wanted them to have access. So that was uh, something that we've done. We've also gone through, we've created um, a chart that depicts what we're currently doing, what um, our state agency requires that we submit in terms of data needs, and then um, what simplicity can do for us. And so we just did a comparison there. And of course, money is always an issue. We were, uh, you know, use certain grants to purchase 
And then sustainability is then again something that we want to ensure that once we determine the data management system that we want to use, we want to be able to also sustain it for years to come. And so I added um, our contact to Simplicity's email in the chat. So if you are looking for a data management system or want to know more, I encourage you to reach out to Blaine Warner. I did give you his email in the chat. He would welcome your questions. They're very responsive. And um, I am gonna share my screen here with you. And this is our needs assessment that we conducted. And so you can see here our TEA requirements. We just made a list of what we thought our data needs were going to be, such as student access to a dashboard, that we want them to have the data in real time as we're getting it. We need to be able to house application essays with our rubrics, our standards, and all of those different things that we are doing. And we made a list of what Simplicity can do, what a university system such as Salesforce can do, and what we're currently using, which you can see lots and lots of spreadsheets. So that's really what we started with. We also bulleted what it would cost so that as our upper administration is looking at that, they can see the cost for implementation, uh, time considerations, because IT will need to be involved in other programs to get it up and running, what resources, and then how we plan to sustain it. And we are still working on that, but this is our process in trying to address what our needs are, what system will do those things, and then how we can make that happen. Thank you so much for sharing. You had a lot of questions around uh, simplicity. And so thank you for sharing that spreadsheet as well um, in the process you used. I think that leads us to, um, there will be, um, after, after this webinar, you'll be able to find it on our resource portal, as well as a brief um, that Dr. Garcia and Dr. Clifton will be adding to, to share um, this, this with you in writing and a brief. And so um, Susie just put it in the chat, feel free to visit our resource portal. Um, we would love to have you there to check out that resources and other resources we have there um, for you um, that we've created for you. Um, with that, um, during this series, if you see any of the principles in action, including data empowerment from today, any of those in actions, please use the Branch Ed Framework hashtag um, to share it with us on social media. We can't wait to see how you're applying the framework in action, and we hope to use that to feature um, different, uh, different things we see on social media in our last webinar of this series. If you enjoyed talking about data today, we have a data workshop tomorrow, um, and it is data is in the details. So Dr. Clifton and Dr. Garcia got you in some of those details today. Um, tomorrow is a workshop that you can get even more close and personal with data, and that is with our own um, uh, at Branch Ed. So please sign up, and I believe you'll see that in the chat if you'd like to sign up for that. And our next Nuts and Bolts series is on December 7th. It will be ensuring success, providing equitable opportunities for all teacher candidates. You can register using the QR code on the screen or using the link in the chat. And lastly, we would love to hear about your experience today by taking a brief poll. Um, so thank you for giving us that feedback. And we just wanna really thank Dr. Clifton and Dr. Garcia for sharing your time with us today, for sharing your experiences and for sharing all of those tangible things that we can take away and actually use in our own practice. Thank you so much. We, we just really appreciate all of the knowledge um, that you shared with us in your, in your journey and your continue journey and we wish you the best of luck as you continue on this data journey. Thank you so much everyone. Have a great Wednesday and a great rest of the month. We'll see you next on December 7th. Bye. <laughs>